Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. Why don't we? Uh, hello. How's it going, everybody? Comic Crack. I'm here with a, uh, uh, I don't know, a bit of a sort of talking about what I picked up and sort of an intro to something that's been on my mind and that I'm going to be diving into um, over the next while. And I hope to post a, a few videos kind of I've dropped off of. It's not that I've dropped off. I've dropped off of making videos about Eclipse Comics that I was doing for a little while there. It's not gone completely. Um, as we all know, our reading habits kind of change and all of a sudden something else pops up on your radar and you dive into that. Uh, the individual that's popped up on my radar more so now, he's always kind of be there, uh, Richard Corbin. Um, I was lucky enough to pick up a few things today uh, from my local uh, comics drug dealer, uh, Greg, who I appreciate very, very much. Um, he really knocked it out of the park with this first kind of chunk that he found um, in his archives. Uh, the, the added bonus for me being that I had a bunch of stuff for trade. Um, I didn't get a chance to set up at Wally Con, which was the latest little mini convention that just happened. Not this weekend. I think it was, was it this weekend or was it last weekend? I think it was last weekend. Um, so I didn't have a chance. That was going to be my plan. Try to get somebody to set up a table with me and try, try my hand at that again for these last times. I'm kind of glad that I didn't. I don't think it would have yielded much results for me. Um, so when I asked Greg if he did accept trades, because uh, he was looking for, because he has kind of a, a mailing list of people that he um, supplies comics to from all over the place, um, as far as I understand it, maybe all over the globe to some degree, he had a request, a mutual kind of friend of ours from the Winnipeg uh, Comic Addicts group. He was asking him about Freak Brothers, and he was kind enough to mention my name and say, you should head up Terrence. Terrence is the Freak Brothers underground guy. He might have some doubles. Unfortunately, the doubles that I did have are, are long gone, except for one. I had a double of uh, the Freak Brothers 3D issue. Um, no glasses, unfortunately. The other Freak Brothers that I do have, I'm collecting multiple printings. So I do have multiples of the issues, but they're all alternate printings. And I don't really want to break those up. But it just sparked an idea of if you're looking for that, do you accept trades? And he said, absolutely, I do. So I was he he found a bunch of Corbin stuff. Um, I salivated as he told me what they were um, and also kind of like felt my wallet uh, hurt my ass a little bit. Uh, so thankfully, I had some stuff that he wanted and we're working out a deal and everything is hunky dory because now this kind of area of Corbin that I'm trying to fill up in my collection is some of his earlier work and some of the stuff that's not as readily available um, but I'm curious about it and I do want to kind of sit with all of it and really have a chance to sort of follow him through his career um, I'm not super hell-bent on going chronologically because I've read so much Corbin over the years, there's stuff that I've revisited just recently, even which one of them we'll be talking about right away. I'm going to go into it in a little more detail. Um, but it is nice, that idea of following a creator throughout their uh, kind of uh, artistic career is always appealing. Um, before we get into that, though, uh, just finished watching the Wonder Woman trailer. Looks pretty great. What is it? Wonder Woman 80, 1986 or something. Looks pretty fantastic. Uh, Black Widow trailer I saw last weekend, possibly. That one looks pretty great, too. Um, interesting to see a couple of uh, female-led superhero movies hitting the theaters next year. That's very exciting. Um, the first Wonder Woman was incredible. Uh, this Black Widow solo story looks really good. The, the trailer looks really, really great. So that'll be very exciting. Um, so when I was kind of preparing for some of this stuff, just doing a little bit of looking online for Richard Corbin info, uh, he's got his own website. Um, the thing that I guess didn't really stand out to me until I started looking him up is uh, he's not a young man. 
Um, he's still with us. He was born October 1st, 1940. Um, so he's still he's still kicking, uh, still creating too. I guess one of the things that really has stood out to me with all this, and I know we talked about it the last video a little bit, a very distinctive looking artist. Uh, even when I was showing my wife some of the stuff I picked up today, her reaction to some of it was like, wow, that's really different looking. And I mean, it it really, really is. His style is very quite a thing. Um, it, it's not as with a lot of artists, it's it's a little easier to kind of pick up on their influences. And you can see some of that in in some of their work, you know, some more obvious than others, some not as obvious, but there's a sort of a wheelhouse with artists. Corbin seems to be a guy that he truly is his own guy. He truly does have his own unique style, uh, which is fascinating to me. And I, I think maybe it was Damien and myself mentioning it. Uh, I don't remember who exactly. He's just been so prolific over his career, starting in kind of, I think, um, Voice of Comicdom was the zine that he first started in. I believe it was issue number 12, and I think that that issue was 1968. That was his first published work. He did a couple of things for Voice of Comicdom. One of them that we're going to look at is um, this Rolf. Um, this actually appeared in two issues of Voice of Comicdom. Uh, number 16 and 17. Now, it has the date as 1970 to 71. I thought it was 69 to 1969 to 1970, but we'll go with this. This is from the Comics Joint website, which has never really steered me wrong. So uh, let's go with that one. Um, so starting that early, and even when we take a look at this in a minute, seeing the level that he entered into the comics industry uh, is very, very high. And I think it's something that I read him talk about on his own website about his kind of uh, association with the underground comics and how he didn't quite fit into that world 100%. He kind of uh, later on in his career played around in uh, mainstream comics um, he never really fit in there either. He did some Ghost Rider stuff. He did one called Banner, I think. Um, he did a Luke Cage story. The Cage one is the only one that I have. I found an issue of the Ghost Rider. I don't know. Maybe I showed it off last time. Or did I? Let's see. Oh, no. Here we go. Yeah, I found a single issue. Uh, oh, it looks like Gerard Way as well, which is something that I didn't realize. So this is Ghost Rider number six here. Found this in a cheap bin the other week. Um, but even with this stuff, as good as it is, uh, he doesn't really fit into the mold of mainstream comics as well. One thing that uh, is talked about on some of the pages that I've found uh when he discovered Heavy Metal magazine or Metal Herlant, uh, he sent some work to uh, to them to have published and then continued to get published when Heavy Metal magazine, the, the American, the English version rather, was uh, created. Um, to me, that's almost, that's more the world that his work fits into comfortably because that entire world of heavy metal and these artists and these ones that kind of bridge the gap between fantasy, sci-fi, um, that's kind of his world because of how scattered some of that stuff is. Um, it's interesting to me as well, just his diving into self-publishing, which we will absolutely take a look in much closer detail at his Fantagore Press stuff. Once I fill in those gaps, that's the that's the next thing I'm hoping Greg uh, will be able to find for me. He hasn't quite got to that portion yet for digging. This was kind of the magazine size stuff that he focused on this first time out. I'm hoping that he uncovers 
uh, the gaps that I have in that collection in one swoop so we can uh, just pick them all up and have a chance to look at them. So Voice of Comicdom, first published work, 1968. Uh, there are copies out there. Um, there's some articles from other zines, a uh, couple that I have my eye on. I'm hoping to pick up on those. I've made some Discog sales recently, and there's a, a box set that's kind of in limbo communicating with somebody, and I'm hoping that they, that I can help them, uh, I can help uh, ease them <laughs> over the edge as far as committing to buy this box set because that'll be a nice, like a really nice chunk of money injected into the PayPal, and once, if that does hit, that's when I think I'll go and dive in and, and try to get first appearances in these early, early interviews uh, from these comic zines and stuff to add to the collection here. And we can have a look at those in more detail if and when those do make it to me. Um, so I thought today we'd start out, why don't we, why don't we start out talking about this Rolf story? So like I said, Voice of Comic um, six, and uh, eventually got reprinted ripoff press uh, this is the second print this is the other underground comics when it comes to the different printings this one is really easy to discern whether you have a first printing or a second printing the second printing has this for a cover and on the back side the first printing will have this as the front cover with this image as the back cover so basically it'll just be the reverse of this um and again it's it's some of these little details that boggle my mind because i don't fully understand printing techniques especially when it comes to coloring um stuff like this boggles my mind i'm hoping that that i can get it close enough that it'll just focus on it Maybe not. I don't think it's coming up as well. But the texture in that shadow that's there, maybe that's hitting it there. Um, the way that that shadow falls on the ground and colors everything in its space and gives it that extra dimension, uh, to me, is is really, really incredible. Um, I have a lot of favorites now that I'm going through this stuff, but this is right up there as one of my favorites uh examples of his color work and what he can do with color um and just the kind of basic shape of a person with the dog there is great um and again the front cover is fantastic as well uh this is a really good example of i think his black and white work and again if we think of the time that this came out in the space of his career um we're looking at some really really high quality Corbin black and white work. I mean, you see all the trademarks of his figures, uh, short of sort of a, a squat, sort of rounded to some degree, especially when it comes to his uh, voluptuous women that he tends to draw. Um, but even with some of the landscapes, this one here specifically, I think is really great as well. Um, it's, a, it's a decent story. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a mind-blowing tale. It does the job to support the artwork. Um, takes place in kind of, a, like I said, a fantasy kind of world where there's a magician who has the power to transform this dog into a human. Uh, doesn't complete the spell, and we end up with a half-dog, half-human that's uh, uh, protecting his uh, his princess. Um, who he's fallen in love with, and by the end, kind of, she's fallen in love with him as well. So, uh, yeah. Barring the chance to get your hands on the black and white version from Ripoff Press, um, if you have a, a collection of heavy metal magazines, have a look for, what do we got here? November 1979, uh, December 1979, and January 1980. And we can find colorized versions of this exact same story presented in three parts. So over the span of three issues here. And we'll pull these out and have a look. Um, and again, as I was going through the archives and pulling this stuff out and sitting with it again, I'm always reminded when I do this, the times that I, I kind of go digging through the heavy metal magazines 
uh, just another reminder at how amazing these issues are. Uh, so here we have the colored version. I want to see if there's any notes at the front here. Uh, no, nothing in the way of, of notes. Uh, so just Rolf by Richard Corbin, part one. So we can see here uh, the color version. And you can rest assured that uh, as is his way, he has had a, a very big hand in how this is going to be colored um, and wanting to make sure that his work gets presented uh, especially early on in his career, I imagine he had, he seems like the kind of artist that wouldn't let some of this stuff go to another person, seeing as it's his stuff. Um, here we go. It wouldn't be the Comic Crack channel. Did I mention that this channel is for adults? If uh, I wouldn't have, uh, show a little bit of boobies there. So, like I said, November 1979, there's the cover for that. We have December 1979 for part two. And then um, January 1980. Uh, I think I might have to cut this for a moment and come back and join you. Uh, so we're going to cut. I will be back for part two shortly.